Well, I was, I've been asked um, by the director uh, if I would, uh, in addition to the, the work I'll be doing as a fellow here, if I would also participate in a, a group uh, discussion about sustainability, about the general topic of sustainability. And I've been thinking about that a bit uh, with respect to the work that we've done on, on climate change and emerging diseases. And so what I'm going to present today is an attempt to generalize some of those things, but it's not meant to be anything definitive. It's more a, it's more a sense of what are the things that I think I could contribute to a much larger discussion. And, and, and this discussion about sustainability uh, in the, the sense of, that I'm going to, to talk today, I think is something that really needs to be done. I, I think it's, it's fairly urgent. Um, and so before, before I begin to distress everybody, let me just acknowledge some people, um, uh, the, the fellows of the Collegium Budapest, IOSC and STIOSC, the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study, where I've been a fellow. Uh, the, the various people at the Institute for Ecology of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, and the Ciencia Sem Fronteras program of Brazil, which allowed me to, to be in Brazil for three months every year for three years. Uh, and just a small number of people, uh, of a very large number of collaborators that I've had during the years. But Sal Augusta, Walter Bieger, and Eric Hoberg, who are my co-authors on the book, uh, Gabor Fultvari and David Herzig, who are parasite people and pathogen people uh, in Hungary. Alicia Juarero, who is not only a, a specialist on dynamic systems and complex systems analysis, but also the CEO of uh, Vector Analytica, which is involved in, in this as well. And of course, or Satmari, who's uh, one of Hungary's scientific treasures. Now, I'm going to make some statements, and these are not meant to be true, they're meant to be what I think, I believe at the moment, based on the work that, that Eric and Walter and I have been doing on, on, on climate change and disease. And one of them is this statement that climate change unites humanity like nothing has ever united humanity before. That's not meant to say that I think that humanity is united in any way at all. And that's part of the problem, of course. And, and there are two reasons for that. The first is that climate change is a national security issue for every country. It affects water security, food security, public health security, sociocultural security, economic security, and of course if it's a security issue for one country, it's a security issue for everybody. Now in addition to that, in addition to being a security issue for individual countries, climate change is also literally beyond belief. Okay? There, it does not discriminate among any human belief system. So as far as climate change is concerned, national borders, social, cultural, economic, political, religious systems mean nothing. That's why we call it global climate change. Now in the past, when people talked about sustainability, and this is part of the, the, the work that Eric and Walter and I did in our book, trying to, to pull some things together, it seems that there are a number of things that people who talk about sustainability want. Okay? Some want a guaranteed future with no costs. Some want a simple and easy to understand description of what's going on and a simple and easy way to solve it. Some want to create a world that is similar to what they think the past was like. This is what we sometimes call a nostalgia for a past that never existed. And some just want the world the way they want it. And how do we get to that? But something has changed because within the last five years in particular, but maybe in the last 10 years, but in the last five years very strongly, this new idea has become to really, has, has come forward. And that is 
that discussions of sustainability now include the notion that we might be in trouble as a species. Before, issues of sustainability had to do with how can we do this better, how can we do that better, how can we provide more for people, blah, blah, blah. But nobody considered before the possibility that the reason we needed to talk about sustainability was because without some productive discussion, we might all die. And that's where evolutionary biologists can play a role. Now it turns out that it's beginning to appear that we don't have nearly as much time as we thought we did, okay? The projections by the International Panel on Climate Change and the <coughs> World Economic Forum of that humanity is not in serious deadly trouble until 2100 actually looks pretty optimistic. Uh, the limits to growth model predicted that we would be in large trouble by 2070. The most recent update of the limits to growth model by the, the, the Melbourne Sustainable Studies Institute suggests that 2050 actually might be the LD50 for humanity. And the ch chief scientist of the UK published an essay at the end of last year, a special Christmas message for the world, saying that he believes that because of social and political unrest, uh, society, human society may be unable to cope with climate change by as early as 2030. So, from a biological standpoint, it turns out that there are indications that the biosphere is beginning to cope with climate change in predictable ways. So ways that paleontologists have documented that the biosphere coped with major climate change events in the past, there are indications that the biosphere is beginning to do that now. And the interesting thing about it is that that means that the biosphere is not asking our permission and it's not waiting for us to decide whether we're going to participate or not. What's at risk? Turns out the biosphere is not at risk. Now some of your favorite species are at risk. There's no doubt about that. Polar bears are going extinct. And polar bears are going extinct because Canadians will not let them share their towns. Canadians are happy for the polar bears to be out on the ice caps. They do not like them when they come into their towns on shore. The ice caps, the ice is melting, the polar bears are coming in, Canadians are killing them, polar bears are going extinct. But the biosphere is not going to go extinct. And the reason for that is because the biosphere is a system of indefinite inherited information. It has tremendous capacity for, for renewal and regeneration. This is a cartoon, a lot of you have seen this sort of thing. It just represents episodes in, in the, the deep past of biological diversification, extinction events, diversification, extinction, diversification, extinction. Every time there's been a major global extinction event, The biosphere has been greatly depleted, but it has re-evolved. Every mass extinction event has been an evolutionary reset event. And Lao Tzu noted that new beginnings oftentimes come disguised as painful endings. So we tend to think about the painful endings, the dinosaurs went extinct. But the reality is when the dinosaurs went extinct, we ended up with the diversity of birds on this planet. So we never talk about things going bad or going wrong in evolutionary biology. We talk about things changing, becoming different. Homo sapiens is also not at risk of extinction. There's some more good news, right? We're not going extinct as a species. And the reason for that is because we're everywhere. There are tons of us all over the world. We're virtually every place on the planet. Even some places that you wouldn't think that people could survive, there are people surviving there. Okay? So, there are too many of us in too many places to think that the species will go extinct even if we don't help ourselves try to survive. There are going to be some human beings. 
The problem is, so far so good, the problem is that, I mean, if we blow up the planet, of course, then who cares? But as long as we don't blow up the planet, some human beings will live somewhere doing something. The real question is, what kind of life are they going to have, those survivors? Because I know a lot of people living up various tributaries of the Amazon who have absolutely no idea what the internet is. But they know how to hunt and fish. And they know how to survive in the jungle. They're going to be surviving. So what's actually most at risk, we believe, and this is, this is where we would want to begin or to add some input into a larger discussion of sustainability is that it's actually technological humanity that's at risk. And, and that's like, really? No, that can't possibly be true. I mean, we're strong. We're technological. We got all this stuff. We got iPhones. We got computers. We got everything. How could we possibly be in trouble? The infrastructure that we have created over the last 12,000 years can't possibly be at risk because mostly we've created this technological infrastructure to protect us from the environment. So I'm going to do a little quick history lesson here. 150,000 to 90,000 years ago, and we just see the, the end point of it here. It started here. It's a period of relative climate stability. And during that time, that's when human beings began to evolve as a technological species. That's when our ancestors moved out of the forest into the grasslands, and somebody picked up a rock and said, huh, if I, if I hit an animal with this, I can eat the animal. So we began to change our diets at the same time we changed our habitats. And the interesting thing about that is that the major change in the diet was adding a significant component of meat to the diet. We were already smart and nasty, because that's what chimpanzees are. Now we got big and fecund. So that, that dietary input. But that meat diet also came with a little extra because we acquired a whole bunch of foodborne pathogens like tapeworms and things like that from the new food that we were eating and the new habitats we were in. Between 90 and 12,000 years ago, here, the climate was not particularly stable. In fact, this is, this is what most of, this is what climate has looked like for most of the history of, of this planet. So this was, you know, a fairly normal period of hot cold, 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 for a long time. And during that time, human beings took advantage of the, the inner, the, the, these periods of warming to move. And then they were isolated, moved, isolated, moved. So human beings began to spread out all over the place during this particular period of time. And as they expanded geographically, they also, there's evidence that they expanded their diet considerably. Basically, human beings will eat anything anywhere they can find it. Now, at this point, we weren't domesticating anything. It was just, we move into this area, what can we eat? And it turns out the answer to that is, if it's not a psychedelic drug, it's food. That's pretty much it for human beings. Occasionally, there's a poison, but mostly human beings can just eat anything. And that resulted in bigger, healthier women. In fact, over the last 150,000 years, the difference in what we call sexual dimorphism, the difference in size between men and women, human men and women, has been decreasing drastically. So the, the major recipients, the major beneficiaries of all this change in diet has been women. Human women have gotten much, much larger in proportion to men over the last 150,000 years. 
And as they've gotten bigger and healthier, they had more and healthier babies, they've lived longer, they've had babies over a longer period of time. Populations grew, <sighs> that created conflict, that clip created migration, we moved to new areas, we picked up new diseases. 12,000 years ago to 7,000 years ago, that's when human civilization as we think of it really was established. That's the beginning of, of what we call the Holocene period. That was a period of, of really unusual climate stability. And this is one of the reasons that, that the scientific community was late understanding the implications of climate change because all of our science emerged during a period of unbelievable climate stability. And that's what led a lot of people to think that the world was fundamentally stable and unchanging and deterministic and all that. Uh, but we were wrong. During this period of climate stability, that's when we would think of, of human civilization beginning to emerge. That's when we became sedentary. We started staying in place more often. Domestication, agriculture emerged during this period of time. And the beginnings of trade emerged at this time. Women become bigger and healthier, produce more people, but now there's less migration, there's less mobility. People still move, except instead of people moving a lot all the time, you now have mostly people staying in one place until there's a catastrophe and then they all move. So at this point, we're losing mobility, which is we are taking away our historical avenue of escape from things like climate change. More conflict, because we're more sedentary, we can't have an argument and somebody moves away. Now we have an argument and we fight. And more diseases, of course, because we're picking up diseases from the things that we're domesticating. We're picking up diseases from the animals that come into our, our uh, areas of habitation, rodents and things like that. OK, this is one of the earliest of these sedentary sites. It's in Turkey. It's about 9,500 years old. This is not considered to be a city. This was just a place where people lived. I, I don't know. I'm not an anthropologist, so I don't understand. But this was, this was not a city. It was just a place where people lived all the time. Then 7,000 years ago, in the last 7,000 years, that's when we have additional climate stability and modern civilization takes place. Okay, now we have the transition from sitting in place to producing permanent cities. So the cities now become hubs of movement. People are moving in and out and in and out, but staying there. Trade changes from being a luxury to being a necessity because, oh, we have bigger, healthier women producing more babies, less mobility, more conflict, more diseases. This is when the first evidence of actual warfare appears. There was a, a, an article that just showed up last week of, of the earliest, what they think is the earliest evidence now of, of an actual organized military conflict. Okay, now during that period of time, seven, during the last 7,000 years, there have been multiple episodes of short, intense climate change episodes. Now you've sometimes heard people say, oh yeah, humans have been exposed to climate change in the past and everything was fine. Actually, the first part is true, the second part is false. We have been exposed to climate change in the past. And every time that's happened, the society that's been exposed to it has been destroyed forever. So we have been exposed to climate change before and we've been destroyed by it. Mostly because we had no idea it was coming. So by the time it happened, it was too late to do anything about it. And that's why there are far more abandoned cities than occupied cities on this planet. About 150 years ago now, we reckon that something called the Anthropocene started. Okay. 
and welcome to the Anthropocene, where we have constructed a largely technological niche for ourselves. And we're living beyond our means in it. We've, cr we've created this thing, and we're spending more than we have. And this is what we call the Trantor Syndrome. Any of, the, any of you who've read the Foundation Trilogy by Isaac Asimov will know. As it turns out that today's modern, hyper-technological, hyper-civilized, powerful cities are density and connectivity traps. These are all of the ways, well, not all, these are five of the ways in which modern, highly technological cities are unusually susceptible to being severely hurt by climate change, including disease outbreaks. These are all features of all modern technological cities. When we talk here about extreme division of labor with extreme interdependency, it's also true that those cities are the places where all of our technological infrastructure is localized now. More than 50% of humans live in cities. By 2050, almost 75% of human beings will live in cities. If cities are, as they have been for the last 7,000 years, unusually susceptible to climate change disruptions, there's a problem. That's one of the reasons I'm extremely interested in the Pannonia Network project. So we need to think outside the box. Everybody says this, it's like the weather. Mark Twain wrote once, everybody complains about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. Climate change is accelerating. It's not just happening, it's accelerating. We are already past some major tipping points. We are already past some of the tipping points for 2100 that the IPCC has set out. We're into a second order world of change, where the rate of change is increasing. We can't afford business as usual if we want to maintain technological society, and we can't afford to do nothing if we want to maintain technological society. Remember, if we do nothing, Homo sapiens will survive. And if you want to follow that, then you teach your children how to hunt with bows and arrows and teach them which berries are edible and which berries are, are not. So here are some evolutionary truisms. So now remember that I'm only suggesting some potential input from biology. I'm not suggesting a solution to anything because I think we're a long way from that. We need to have this discussion, but I think we're a long way from it yet. So one of the things we have to understand is that every evolutionary change that happens involves costs as well as benefits. There's no such thing as an evolutionary change that's just beneficial. Everything that happens has some downside. Women getting bigger and healthier means we have more babies. Agriculture means we have more food, we have more babies. We have more food, but we're staying in one place. We have more food, but uh, evolutionary changes are the result of conflict resolution. They are not the result of conflict per se. So the important thing is conflict resolution and they almost always involve some kind of cooperation. Now there are evolutionary biologists, sort of social commentators, who claim that it's nothing but conflict. But the reality is, the, the, the history of evolution of life on this planet is that successful evolutionary transitions involve conflict resolution and large amounts of cooperation. We have to understand that evolutionarily, we are not man the hunter. We are man the hunted. We are not descended from predators, we're descended from prey items. And that actually explains a lot of our reproductive biology and a lot of our psychology. We made ourselves into hunters, but that's a relatively recent layer on top of everything else. And the notion of progress in evolution is survival and persistence. It's not anything getting better. Things don't get better, they don't get worse, they change. The progress is basically, I'm still here. That's as much progress as evolutionary theory can promise. 
The point of the brief history of humanity that I showed you was to show that there are always costs as well as benefits. Okay? And those who believe that, and who write, that cooperation is somehow non-Darwinian have obviously never read Origin of Species. So you have to read the original texts. So someone, when Richard Dawkins says, it's all about selfishness and cooperation is non-Darwinian, uh, have you ever read the book? Or RTFM, as it's sometimes said. Read the manual. Now, we're smart, but we're not descended from predators. We're descended from prey. Okay? That's why, when I was saying, our reproductive biology is the reproductive biology of prey items. We don't regulate our biology very well, our reproduction very well. We made ourselves into hunters, but like all good prey items, we're a very fearful species. Predators are cautious, but they're not afraid. We're afraid. And we come by it honestly. Okay? Nobody's fault, but everybody's to blame. So here I'm going to call out the scientific community. In our efforts to make the public take responsibility, we have frightened them to death about climate change. And one of the things about human beings as prey items is that when you make them afraid, they all want to go on an Egyptian boat ride because fear breeds denial. Nothing is so much to be feared as fear. Henry David Thoreau borrowed and modified slightly by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But the notion that psychological denial is extremely powerful in human beings is very old. The story of Cain and Abel is not so much a story of don't kill your brother, which is always a good thing to not do. It's primarily a story about the power of denial. God, that God, the God, comes to Cain and says, where's your brother? This is talking to God, and he says, brother? What brother? Oh, the dead one over there. I didn't notice that. He's talking to God. That's how powerful psychological denial is in us. And it turns out that without that level of denial, we probably couldn't have survived as a species. If we were just afraid all the time, we would either kill ourselves or we would stay in the cave until we starved to death. So there had to be something in our psychology that says, yes, I know there's a possibility that a leopard could kill me today, but it's not going to get me. And it turns out that denial has some positive aspects of this. So we've identified what we call the denial spectrum syndrome. And there are three elements of it. Nothing is happening is one of them. Hiding in the castle is one of them, and running away from home is another one. So nothing is happening. There are a lot of variations on this. There is no climate change. Everything's fine. We can stop and reverse climate change before it gets too bad. Technology will save us. It'll be fine. We're better off than 100 years ago, so it's fine. It's not as bad as we thought it might be, so it's fine. If we admit the truth publicly, people will panic, so let's just pretend it's fine. It's not our fault. Someone else needs to take care of it, and they will, so it's fine. Or my favorite, I'll be dead, but my children will figure it out, and it'll be fine. Hiding in the castle. In 1842, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a short story called The Mask of the Red Death. There's a story of a medieval village where a smallpox outbreak occurred, the Red Death as it was called, and all the rich people gathered together a whole bunch of food and wine and good stuff, and they went inside the castle and they closed the gates and said, we're going to have a party until all the poor people die and the, the epidemic is over. A month later, the epidemic is over. The poor people who are still alive open up the gates of the castle and everybody inside is dead. Cities. Density and connectivity traps. Those who feel the most protected may be the most vulnerable. And if they feel the most protected and it keeps them from taking their safety seriously, then they will have created their own problems. Running away from home, this is my favorite. This is the solution to climate change 
by a significant number of physicists. Let's just build a spaceship and run away. We've got no answers. We're just going to run away to another planet. Well, I would, I would suggest that before they ask humanity to spend a whole lot of money making an enormous spaceship to go to another planet, that they first do a proof of concept showing that before they go to another planet in another solar system, they know how to properly care for a planet. And, oh, there's one right here that they can, they can test that out on. So this is just, to me, this is just like your teenager saying, if you won't let me use the internet at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm running away from home. Okay, so we cannot stop climate change. We can't reverse it. And at this point, we may not even be able to slow it down very much. But we may be able to buy time. All is not hopeless. Because the most fundamental form of psychological denial, as the ancient Greeks recognized, is hope. When Pandora's box was open and all the plagues of humanity were released on the world, trampled at the bottom of the box was hope. And the point of the myth was don't close the box and imprison hope inside. If you're going to let everything else out, you've got to let hope out as well. Now, hope is not rational. But, and that's why it's not a plan, but it gives us a reason to plan. If you have no hope, then you just accept what's going to happen and you say, this is, this is the way it's supposed to be. Within evolutionary biology, there is a sense of natural hope, that is, the hope of survival and persistence. The evolution teaches us that the old will inevitably pass away, but that it will be replaced by the new. Now, human beings understand this, and we don't like it very much. I'm 67 years old. I'm not very happy about the fact that I'm not going to be around for much longer. On the other hand, I have a daughter, I have grandchildren, I have stepchildren. I have set the stage for the new. Evolution does that, human reproduction does that. We also understand this. And that's our basis for linking sustainability in the sense of persistence and survival with a, this built-in sense of hope that most human beings have. We've actually done a lot of good things. And they have bought us time. That's one of the reasons that we haven't had the collapse of civilization that people like Paul Ehrlich believed would happen by now. This hasn't happened yet. And that's because we actually have done things with respect to energy, with respect to, to sustainable use of resources, with respect to pollution reduction, even with respect to distribution of food around the world, that have bought us time. But the problem is, we've mostly wasted that time that we bought because we thought that every one of those little successes we had was an indication that we were going to stop climate change and reverse it. Instead of realizing that all we were doing was buying time so that we could then do the real work, which is how do we adapt to what's coming? We weren't stopping it. So our policies moving forward have to be aimed at buying time to cope with what is coming rather than saying, we're going to stop this. I mean, that's very heroic. We're going to stop this. It's also delusional. Anticipate to mitigate is a plan. Now, in the past, when human societies have been destroyed by climate change or disease, it's been because they were surprised by what happened. They didn't know it was coming. We now have the scientific information and capability to anticipate what's coming. And if we're not stupid enough to say it's not going to happen, we can use that to anticipate what's, what's coming. And we can use that to mitigate the impact. Now what happens if you anticipate that something really bad is going to happen and it never happens? Everybody has a party. 
What happens if you fail to anticipate something bad that you could have dealt with, and it happens? People kill you. That's the, the same kind of, of very pragmatic logic that has led all of the world's military organizations to invest heavily in information about climate change. Because part of their mandate for national security is never be surprised by something you should have anticipated. What can biologists offer? Well, there are some things that biologists can offer, some evolutionary principles. And, and one of the things that, that I'm going to start with is the four laws of, of biologists. Or if you've read your Isaac Asimov, you'll realize that I've just ripped off the four laws of robotics. And I've switched humanity for robot and the biosphere for humanity. And the interesting thing about this is that all the way through that is may not harm, may not harm, may not harm. That shows up all the way through that. And in an evolutionary sense, not doing any harm means preserving evolutionary capacity. So what that means is that you can utilize natural resources, but not beyond their ability to cope with being used. In other words, as long as you maintain evolutionary capacity, you can do whatever you want to do. So this doesn't actually limit humanity as much as it might seem. <coughs> okay, now, now, now we get to something I know is a bit of a crossover. So if we have that kind of, of ethos, can we still have growth? And the answer is, yeah, sometimes. I mean, because that's what we see in biology. Yeah, sometimes it grows, sometimes it goes down, sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes up. Just like the climate, sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold. Okay, so yeah, you can have growth when it doesn't conflict with the other laws and when it's possible. Okay, this is what John Maynard Smith called the gambler's ruin. And I'm going to use the analogy of how would a Darwinian play poker? Okay? Now, how many of you think that the, the purpose of playing poker is to win all the money? Right? Well, that is why most human beings play poker. They want to win all the money. If you're a Darwinian, you don't care about winning all the money. You care about always being there for the next hand. So long as you have enough money so that you can keep playing, then you're, that's Darwinian poker. You can play forever. Now, sometimes you have a lot of money, sometimes you won't have so much money, but you'll never have no money. And that's what, what Maynard Smith called the gambler's ruin. No matter how big and powerful your species is, it can still go extinct. No matter how small your species is, if it gets lucky, it can grow. <coughs> nothing's absolute, but nothing's ruled out. It's all very contextual. So here's a convenient truth. The scientific community has had the crap kicked out of it by politicians and, and journalists and pundits and blah, 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 blah. And it hasn't stopped us from planning. We actually have a really good idea of what to do in a concrete sense, what kinds of things to do. But we've run out of time now. We're just sitting there. It's like we've made a Ferrari and there's no gasoline in the tank. So what do we do with it? And if we believe, as, as a group, the scientific community believes that if effective action is not taken immediately, not begun immediately, technological humanity has two to four generations left. All climate change scientists have followed some version of this 
what we call the Dhamma Protocol. Document what's going on. Assess the significance of what's happening. Determine the really critical points. Monitor them. And when you see something that needs to be done, act on it. Okay, that's the model. Now, what, is, what do scientists actually do? They document, they assess, they monitor, they document, they assess, they monitor, and they tell people who can make action happen in societies that they need to do something. The problem is, there's no place on this planet where scientists have the ability to act on their own. All action requires cooperation from the rest of society. Now that's why this is what most scientists believe the protocol is. It's not the Donald protocol, it's the damn protocol. Because we document, we assess, we monitor, and then nothing happens. At least nothing effective. And this is how most scientists see policymakers. And I was, I was sorry to hear that, that uh, Attila's mother-in-law died last night, and, and he's not here because I put this beware of good intentions in there just for, because of his comment last week. But this is, again, this is from one of Asimov's foundation books, talking about a mayor whose <coughs> his stilted geometric love of arrangement with system, his indefatigable and feverish interest in the pettiest facets of day-to-day -day bureaucracy was industry, indecision when right was caution, Blind stubbornness when wrong was determination, and he wasted no money, killed nobody needlessly, and meant well. And everything went to shit. The time is short, the danger is great, we are largely unprepared. That's the mantra for right now. But we can change that with action. And the scientific community can't do that. We can't do that. We can't, can't defeat a common foe if we're at war with ourselves. Soon there are going to be only two kinds of places on this planet. Places that people are running away from and places that people are running to. If the rains do not begin in Cape Town in June, by August, Cape Town will be abandoned. This is, this is real stuff. I was in Brazil three years ago when Sao Paulo had only 60 days of water left. Then the rain started, everybody forgot about it. It wasn't, even, it wasn't even discussed in the next election campaign for the mayor. Everything's fine. It'll never happen again. So the most difficult obstacle to cooperation that I see is that your own, is understanding that your own future security depends on the welfare of your neighbors, even if you don't like them very much. And whether or not we can get to that point may determine who, who survives and who doesn't survive. I, I actually believe that very much. So, not totally happy. So I tell people I have a lot of hope, but not much optimism. So I have a lot of hope because I look at what the younger generation knows and does and believes and how connected they are and what their world is like. But I have a lot of optimism because I've experienced multiple government bureaucracies for 50 years, many different kinds of, of governments, and I've seen a lot of things not happen. So hope, but not a lot of optimism for my generation, and maybe hope and optimism for the next generation. Thank you.